Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your co-host today along with Clarissa Kennedy. Dr. Federici is a clinical psychologist and the owner of the Center of Psychology and Emotional Regulation in Midland, Ontario. She specializes in the assessment and treatment of eating disorders, personality disorders, and trauma. She serves as an adjunct faculty position or professor at York University and is a distinguished fellow of the Academy of Eating Disorders. From 2019 to 2022, Anita served as the elected co-chair for the Suicide and DBT Special Interest Group and currently sits on the Special Interest Group Oversight Committee for the Academy of Eating Disorders. Dr. Federici has developed a robust training program as well as a wide network of allied health professionals. She also runs a treatment center in Midland, Ontario. Dr. Federici has authored over 375 peer-reviewed research articles, book chapters, conference presentations, and lectures, establishing herself as an authority on eating disorders and mental health. We at Food Junkies are keen to learn how eating disorders and food addiction may intersect in our population. Welcome, Dr. Federici. Thank you so much. Thank you for such a lovely introduction and for inviting me to be here today. I will clarify, I have not published or peer-reviewed 375 articles. I have done 375 presentations and talks and have some of my work published, but geez, that would be quite a lot of publications. It would be indeed. We always like to start with a bit of a personal touch. How did you get involved in the whole field of eating disorders, trauma, and personality disorders? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's hard to keep that short. I'm 25 years into the field. It's something that evolved. It evolved over time out of my own experiences and watching where the gaps were in eating disorders care. I I started wanting to help people. I was interested at the time looking at women's health. That was sort of where it was 25 years ago. And and eating disorders are something near and dear to my heart, both in terms of lived experience and, and within my family of origin. It was a natural interest from the beginning. And as I grew up academically in the eating disorders field, to me, it was just eye-opening to see what we were doing well and what we were not doing, which is how I got into trauma and what we call personality disorders. I don't, I don't even love that terminology to be honest with you. But this notion of what are we doing with people who have an eating disorder who also have these co-occurring difficulties like trauma, like severe emotion dysregulation, like suicide and self-injury. And I grew frustrated with sort of standard approaches, to be honest, which led me to move into a a dialectical behavior therapy uh, model, which made a whole lot more sense to me. And so the rest of my career has really been looking at who is most misunderstood, who is most underserved, and how to do better. That's right in the trenches, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I I often feel like I'm in the trenches, sometimes Um, quite alone and sometimes with some excellent company. So it's been a long journey. um, In a nutshell, can you please give us the various types of eating disorders and the, the key features of them and some of the considerations for treatment? In a nutshell, eating disorders is an umbrella term for at least seven different types of problems that people have with feeding and eating and regulating their experiences in their bodies. The term eating disorder is not a singular term. And as you get to know more and more about eating disorders, you realize how how different they are and then how similar they are. Right? The most common ones, if I were to go out on the street and pull 100 people, I say, what are eating disorders? Most people are going to talk about anorexia or they're going to talk about bulimia. PB binge eating disorder now. What I always teach people is that all eating disorders are characterized by three sort of dominant characteristics. One, they're all defined by an individual's inability to properly feed themselves. 
for one reason or another, they struggle with what most people take for granted, which is the ability to eat and digest food and regulate that whole process. So all eating disorders are characterized by that. Two, all eating disorders have unique neurobiological underpinnings. We're learning, we're, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but they don't just come out of nowhere and they're not just socially constructed. So we know that there are very unique biotemperamental characteristics, metabolic issues that hormonal issues that define and shape the development of an eating disorder. And then we know that eating disorders are also come with other characteristic symptomology, body image, some body image distress, fears of food and eating, perfectionism, all kinds of different things that define it. So it's not disordered eating. It's actually an eating disorder. So these are very severe illnesses that, that carry high mortality rates. So pretty dangerous stuff in a nutshell. So that's the first part. Before you go on, I was really struck. You're making a distinction between disordered eating and eating disorders. Can you just elaborate on two sentences with that one? I think it's actually difficult in the world we live in. I think disordered eating has become the norm. So I think it's actually really hard sometimes to tell, is this someone that is eating in a way that 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 is not, that, that sort of is an extension of diet culture and they're really not feeding themselves well versus an eating disorder. A lot of people have disordered eating habits and many do not meet the diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder in which those behaviors are causing physical health problems, relational issues, quality of life issues, right? So one of the key differences is that people with eating disorders, there are significant functional impairments that you might not see, don't see with people with disordered eating. Thank you. We might come back to that because that might be the link with the food addiction. You mentioned something about the neurochemistry. Please tell us a little bit more about that. This to me is one of the most fascinating areas of my career, <laughs> which is the ongoing research, because it really is ongoing. You and we could meet in a year from now, and there's, I'm probably going to have more information to tell you. Even in the last five, 10 years alone, we have learned so much more about the neurometabolic underpinnings of eating disorders that when I started 25 years ago, none of us had any idea about. So for, here are two key ones. One is a landmark trial led by Cynthia Bulick and colleagues. This is a multinational, international study looking at the genome of people with anorexia nervosa compared to those without anorexia. One of the key findings that I will highlight today, and there are several, but one that stands out to me is that people with anorexia have differences. They would say abnormalities, but they have differences on the two of the chromosomes related to metabolism. If you think about metabolism, what does metabolism do? What is metabolism? I'm going to put you two on the spot for a moment. What do you think? Meta- what? Yeah, it breaks down the food that you're eating. It breaks down food. Usually we think of it in the context of insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity. I don't know if that's where you're going, but that's usually where we think about it. But it's our ability to use energy, right? Yeah. In some way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's all of these things, right? It's actually quite a complex process or system in our bodies and that regulates digestion, how food is absorbed in the body, energy expenditure, insulin resistance, like all of these. Now, how fascinating is it that people with anorexia actually have quote unquote abnormalities or there's on these couple of chromosomes. That to me makes so much sense. Can I challenge you there for a second? Yes. How do we know that it's not that the eating itself has created that metabolic abnormality? I think that's an excellent That's an excellent question. I, and I don't know that anybody can know that yet. I think that we have, because again, you'd have to, you'd have to follow up basically everybody, children and longitudinally figure out who developed an eating disorder, who didn't and what was different. What we do know right now is that regardless of whether it's chicken or egg, yeah. there's definitely something going on in terms of metabolic functioning. And Cindy Bulick and colleagues have actually argued that anorexia, at least illness alone, because we don't have the data yet for other eating disorders, that should be reformulated as a, a neurometabolic illness, not as a psychiatric illness, which is fascinating to me. The other one that I think is really interesting, and then we can talk about treatment and, and these sorts of things, but the other one is the explosion of research looking at ARFID. So this is, you know, right, restrictive feeding intake disorder, ARFID, usually starts in childhood and is characterized by, again, an inability to feed oneself for different reasons. And there's three subtypes. One is a subtype in which the person has a lack of interest in 
and eating. They just have low, uh, they, they talk about not being hungry, et cetera. Another one is fear of aversive consequences. So these are often people who have had a choking experience or an anaphylactic experience and then food becomes dangerous. So they learn food is dangerous and they're not eating enough. And the third is a sensory so that there, there are just oral sensitivities that make eating and, and taste very different. So one of the things that, that we know now, based on a recent study, is that if you look at the group who have low interest, low approach to food, for those people, their levels of hormones that regulate hunger and fullness signals in the brain, right? This is CCK and ghrelin and these sorts of things. What they've been able to show is that under fasting conditions, so if you take a group of, let's say, kids with ARFID, they go to bed, right? They haven't eaten all night. You test their hormones in the morning. Their hormones related to fullness are very high. So they're not hungry. But now imagine that kiddo walks downstairs and mom and dad who are trying to feed their kiddo have this plate of pancakes and they're like, come and eat. And this kiddo's going, I'm not hungry. And everybody goes, but of course you are. And what we're learning is that it's not that simple. It's not that this is somebody that's just trying to not eat or this is somebody, it's much more complex. So in this example, that person may actually be responding appropriately to a hormonal experience where they're actually full. So now that has huge, these studies have huge implications for how we think about eating disorders and how we treat them. That's really quite fascinating. Do you have any kind of research that looks at bulimia and the neural hormonal abnormalities? Like, for there's, example, their leptin is resistant or something like that. There's more, again, it's, it's so, it's evolving and there's so much coming out right now that it, I'm trying to stay on top of it. Uh, you know, I, and so there are a number of studies published papers that actually review what we know to date, both in terms of anorexia, arshid, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. Anorexia and ARFID are getting the most attention right now. And I also know that these large groups are expanding that to include, I think, almost all of the eating disorders. There's definitely changes or differences. And that has led me to really, whether I have the data or not, I really do believe that there are underlying neurometabolic factors that drive and maintain. When we talk about food addiction, which we'll do a little bit later for those of you listening, there is again a common intersection because we look a lot at ghrelin and leptin and their abnormalities in food addiction because there is a backdoor. Dopamine affects ghrelin and it affects leptin. So this is just fascinating how... Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We talked a little bit about the neurology. Can you say more about the role of genetics in general or um, then, of course, of the environmental factors in the development of the eating? Yeah. One of the things that we always say in the eating disorders field is that genes load the gun, the environment pulls the trigger, right? You've heard that sort of thing before. So when I educate people about eating disorders, I talk about a number of different genetic underpinnings. Now, again, I can't do a blood test with somebody and go, oh, you... You have this. It's not that specific. I, I talk to them about the research. I talk to them about metabol possible metabolic differences, hormonal differences. We know that eating disorders run in families. Uh, when you look at twin studies or adoption studies, so there's things like that. I also talk uh, to people about sensory and perceptual differences that underlie some eating disorders. For example, there's that characteristic image of somebody who looks in the mirror and they, they show somebody that is an average body type and they look in the mirror, but they look, they experience themselves as much larger. And then everybody wants to go, oh, but you don't. That's not, that's not accurate. One of the things we're learning is that there are perceptual differences in some people that have eating disorders. There's something called Alice in Wonderland syndrome that we often hear about. We talk about epilepsy or certain brain disorders, things like that, or even sometimes with migraines. And what that means is that the person can experience the body as changing shape and size. And so I started to think about that with eating disorders. And there's a little bit of research here, but I actually believe that people with some eating disorders do experience body bodies shifting, changing, swelling in a way that most people don't. Like most of us, you eat breakfast, you probably don't notice a lot of changes in your body. But I think that that some people with eating disorders absolutely are hyper aware or experience body sensations differently. This is all the genetic background that goes on. But then you can't separate that. There's a lot of people that have these things that probably never develop an eating disorder, right? I talk a lot about invalidating environments. So these are environments that communicate that you are not, you are, you need to change. You're not okay the way you are. You're too much. You're not enough. Environments that can be 
be abusive? How do you separate all this out when we live in North American culture that is defined by diet culture, weight discrimination? When you start to, if you have this biology and you have to grow up developmentally in this kind of an environment, my gosh, it's like the perfect storm. So I think these things are some of the key pieces. There's so many, there's so many sociocultural factors to think about with eating disorders. You mentioned this, it crossed my mind, the whole body positivity movement. How does that fit into the eating disorder model? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, it's a great question. I tend not to look at things as in, in any kind of binary. Like I'd say, okay, what was the function of the body positivity movement? It was born out of discontentment and, and anger and fieriness. Good. Where people said, this is ridiculous. Like bodies are bodies. We're not all meant to look the same. We're not all meant to, to grow the same way. And, and so I think it was born out of that advocacy to change the way we think and talk about bodies. Then there's this kind of, of course, like anything, there's some backlash around that, that it's almost too, too Pollyanna-ish. It's too, it doesn't really speak to the suffering that when you have body image issues, you can't just body positive your way out of them. I think it's helpful to challenge thoughts. I think it's helpful, but you got to deal with some of the underlying sensory issues, perceptual issues, and just learning how to eat and be in a body is a whole thing. So I, I, I always talk to my clients about what's helpful for you rather than what's right or wrong. If you find it helpful to be connected with body positivity as it is, great. There's also some criticism that some body positive sort of ambassadors, if you will, still promote body positive if you still have makeup on and if you still dress this way, right? As well, are we trying to do health at every size? Are we trying to just say, listen, bodies are bodies. Uh, genetically, we're not going to look the same. It might also be an, uh, uh, an apology uh, for letting people continue to eat the way that they are, they're eating, it, which aligns with what you're saying. We're not really addressing the dynamics behind it. I think you have, I think it's not a treatment for eating disorders. Yeah. It's a sociocultural movement. It, it's not. So I, I wouldn't say that you're treating an eating disorder by becoming body positive. I think some people may find solace because sometimes you find, you often find like-minded people that can always be helpful and supportive, but that doesn't address all of these other things that cause and maintain these serious illnesses. So okay. I just had a quick question about that. Since we're talking body right now, how is it that you would work with a client that struggles with maybe body image in regards to eating disorder? Is it more yeah. of a body neutrality? Is it more of embodiment practices rather than? Yeah. Yeah. What have you found to be the most effective? Because <laughs> I know in our field, I know it's still bio-individual, but I know in our field, that's still something that shows up all the time. It's usually we make oh, yeah. addiction and then we do some of the emotional psychology work. And then the yeah. body image piece is that last piece that yeah. really takes, it's a lifelong journey to be fair. It is. I think that's well said. I think that, and the field is still just grappling with what are the most evidence-based ways of helping people with body. So what I'd first say is working with can depend on where somebody is in terms of the severity of their symptoms. So if I have somebody that is highly symptomatic, malnourished, maybe medically unstable, I'm probably not going to get to a whole lot of great body image work in that. In, we also have lots of evidence that the more malnourished, or, or unbalanced one's eating, the worse people feel about their body image. So it's hard to treat body image and start to speak about embodiment if somebody's really in the throes of that. We also know that the more people are attached to social media, the worse they feel about their body. So there's all these things that you have to conceptualize and think about. So there's, it depends, where are you? Where are we with symptomology itself? And I, and no matter what, I still think that it's very important to validate how hard it is to live in a body that feels either foreign or feels like it's betrayed you, which is what a lot of people experience, or a body that has sensory differences, just deep validation and appreciation. One of the things that's interesting, at least again, I can say for anorexia, which I suspect I would see across many eating disorders, but we only have the evidence in anorexia right now, is that the function of restriction, one of the functions of restriction in anorexia is actually to soothe an unsettled biology. So what happens for most people, if you don't eat breakfast or lunch, we don't like it, right? People, we get grumpy, we get hangry, we get lethargic. 
lethargic. We're, we're not happy people usually, right? People that have anorexia have an opposite effect. They're actually more soothed, more energized. They feel better. They can concentrate more, at least in early stages. And we see that as being tied to that underlying unsettled biology. So you have to think about the function and how somebody's coping. So when I get to body image, I know I need to help them understand their body image stories. So I do a lot of that work. I have to make sure that they have a skill set to tolerate discomfort. Like part of learning to feed oneself and, and recovering from an eating disorder means you, you're going to have to tolerate some things that do not feel okay. That's a hard skill set if you don't have it, which is often where we see symptom substitution, right? We stop the eating disorder symptoms and then all of a sudden you have other symptoms that come in, which to me speak to that underlying unsettledness or that lack of skills that somebody needs. Then you can start to talk about, I'm a huge support. I love yoga. I think non, like true yoga, not mere, not hot yoga, hot yoga if you're in a, in a safe space, like not right. hot yoga if you're medically unstable. Mm -hmm. I think that yoga without mirrors and without, you don't have to wear Lululemon to go do yoga, right? Like, right. I think actually can be incredibly healing. And the last thing I guess I would say is I do practice more from a body neutrality perspective, not body positivity. I do spend a lot of time working on learning to speak about your body without judgment. So you don't have to love your body. You don't even have to like your body. And can we reduce that harshness? This is your earth suit. Okay, this is it. Here it is. I can't change it, right? This is the earth suit. So how can we learn to live with as opposed to against our own biology, our own sociocultural experiences? I love that so much. It's more like body respect, right? Which I think for a lot of people who come from a background of spending their whole life hating their body, to ask them to love their body or certain parts of their body oh, yeah. is just something they're going to feel like a failure at again because it's almost unattainable for some. So just to be able to have moments of peace throughout the day where you're not thinking about body can be a win for some people. It can. And, and even to be able to sit with the discomfort in a way that I think of John Kabat-Zinn's work way back when he would work with people who had chronic pain. And, and that's where mindfulness-based stress reduction came in. And he would work with people that could barely make it through an hour without just excruciating pain. What he showed was that through the practice of mindfulness, he could teach people not to get rid of the pain or the discomfort, but to live with it as a part of one's experience on this earth in a way that's less harmful and less damaging. Yeah. People reported feeling so much better, actually reported feeling less pain. His research is so seminal. And so is this, you spoke several times about distress tolerance and how important that is in working with eating disorders. Is that why DBT or dialectical behavior therapy for people who don't know what it is, is your go-to maybe treatment more eating disorders? Yes. And yes. And the skills in DBT to me are make up a quarter of what actually DBT is. And people often think of DBT as just distress tolerance. And I'm like, ah, oh, yes, for sure. I think we could all benefit from distress, learning how to tolerate distress and conflict and tension and, and all kinds of things. Why I use DBT, and I use a, a particular type of DBT, we call it med DBT for multi-problem eating disorders. One, because it's built on a dialectical philosophy, which the whole notion of the treatment is that there's multiple truths happening all at the same time. I am not the expert all the time. So I'm constantly looking for what I'm missing and integrating opposing views and opposing Posing needs so that we can move forward. I think DBT offers, it's a modality that can handle multiple co-occurring difficulties, whereas standard eating disorder treatments laser focus on food, eating, weight restoration, which is important to the exclusion, though, of understanding one's emotional system and understanding the invalidating environment. And so DBT, med DBT brings in all of this. So it's a misconception to think of DBT as just to tolerate emotions. It's actually about learning to live with emotions. It's learning how to communicate effectively. It's learning how to counter the invalidating environment. It's just such a robust model and one of the most compassionate ones I've ever used. And aspects of mindfulness as well are certainly key yeah. components of dialectical behavior therapy. 
I certainly wanted to speak to you about harm reduction in eating disorders, Mm -hmm. because I know this is something that maybe sometimes you get some backlash about and not everyone in the field is in agreement about harm reduction. Can you explain what harm reduction in eating disorders looks like and why you think it's important? Harm reduction in general is an approach that has been used across lots of uh, mental health programs to find ways of working with people, meeting people more where they're at, trying to minimize damage as the goal, at least initially, or maybe for long periods of time. But the idea would be, so for example, if I have somebody that's purging, I may be looking at, okay, so the next time you purge, can you talk to your doctor about whether you need potassium supplements so that you don't get into a medical instability crisis? As opposed to, we are 100% working on full recovery, whatever that even means, right? So harm reduction in eating disorders, I don't think has been super well-defined, to be honest with you. I think most people feel very nervous. Most clinicians feel very nervous about that concept because, because one, we know that the longer people go with symptoms, the more damage that causes to the body. That's a dangerous thing. We know that eating disorders have high uh, mortality rates. The stat out of just the U.S. alone is that every 52 minutes somebody dies as a direct result of their eating disorder. And most of that is due to the damaging effects of binging, purging, malnourishment, et cetera. And so there's a lot of fear that if we don't push, that we're actually not really helping people effectively or appropriately. I do think that's true. Like if I'm meeting someone for the first time, they've never had treatment. Yeah, I'm going to be like, listen, we got to Let's try to do this. Then there's a whole other group of people that have been in and out and in and out of treatments that have not worked or have worked in an inadequate way. And I do think being able to offer harm reduction pathways is very important. I would actually argue that med DBT, it can be harm reduction. And so what I mean by that is when I start working with somebody, I the, the first goal is not full recovery. The, the first goal is, are you willing to stay alive so you and I can see what we want to do? That's very harm reduction. <laughs> so in the, my, my first even month or more with somebody is trying to figure out how do we make sure that you're not bradycardic, low heart rate? How do we make sure that your electrolytes are stable? And so to that end, we target the eating disorder so that you can stay alive. Not necessarily that that you're going to fully recover. I don't know yet. I, I got to get to know you. What's your life worth living dream? What do you really want? Should we try to do more? But I get a lot more willingness with people when there's that ability to start with, hey, do we just want to not die right now? Can we work on that? And then we evolve together. Yeah, I know. I think it's beautiful because I think it's so important. And we do the same, obviously, in addiction treatment, right? When we talk exactly. about harm reduction, it's what can we do to keep you alive today? If that's like Suboxone, if it's methadone, whatever it is, because we can't help you if you're not alive. And so I think it's so important. It is. And again, there's a difference between, okay, I don't want to die right now versus full recovery. I think you're asking, those are two different asks. And I believe that they require different therapeutic interventions to help a person figure out what they want to do. Instead of what you as the clinician want them to do. It's so hard because I'll tell you, it is scary. It is really scary when you've got somebody, especially youth. The frontline treatment for an adolescent is family-based therapy because there are discrete developmental windows. If you... Most people would never say, let's do harm reduction with a teenager who has an eating disorder because the damage can be profound and it's very scary. And and that's because of the development of brain at that particular time, as well as all the coping mechanisms, emotional. Exactly. There's so much developing at these in these very sort of specific windows. And we also know that the sooner in an ideal world, the earlier you can stop the eating disorder, the better the outcome. If we were just talking about the treatment of adolescents, I would be talking much more about FBT approaches. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's very interesting as well, because I think for a lot of probably even our audience, some of this started in our youth. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And some of your audience may have children now that are struggling. Right. Maybe early eating disorder symptoms or maybe more. And so FBT is considered the gold standard. FBT stands for family-based treatment. And if you Google it, you'll find all kinds of information on it. FBT, like I said, gold standard for anorexia and bulimia. There are now adaptations of that for ARFID because you do need to treat ARFID differently than you treat anorexia or bulimia. It is uh, a manualized treatment. That means that you would work with a clinician who empowers the parents 
to help feed their child. And so it's it's like having a, a coach that really helps the parents figure out how they're going to feed their child and cope with how difficult that is. In FBT, like we do in, in lots of treatments, we see the family as integral, integral to the process, unless there's some extenuating circumstance that would make it not safe. It usually takes six months to a year and it works in phases. There's three stages. Stage one is the parents feed the child. Stage two is this kind of helping the adolescent start to take back some of that responsibility so they can start to feed themselves. And stage three is making sure that they're managing relapse prevention and getting back into their lives, that kind of thing. Yeah. What you're describing is so perfect for food addiction as well. And for people listening, we're going to do a second podcast just uh, focusing on that. I'm really interested in your opinion in the food and the eating disorder community opinion on various medications. I don't know if we have time to talk about the standards like Prozac and Vyvanse, but we have to talk about the GLP-1s because they're an explosion. So if you want to talk about your views on that, and then I'd like to also get your views on bariatric surgery. Sure. In general, there are very few FDA-approved medications for eating disorders. And I'm not an expert. I'm not a physician, so I'm careful about what I say. But I, in my trainings, I often bring in my colleagues who work in, who are psychiatrists, etc. And they will often say that outside of venlafaxine for being purging, there's really not a lot. There is no medication for anorexia or ARSHID as far as we know, and so on and so forth. So I'm happy to talk more about that. But the juicier part are these medications that that induce weight loss. So for I people am, listening, that's the GLP-1s like Ozempic and... Uh, v. Yeah. Go v, right. Yeah. Mondero, so, yeah. Mondero, yeah, that's right. Jeez. I think I can speak for many of us in the field when I say that there, we were just really concerned. We're very concerned about these medications. I'm speaking with my eating disorder hat on. I'm not talking about the general population that does not have an eating disorder. I'm talking about a couple of things. One, these medications induce starvation. That's what they do. They drop your appetite. People will say, oh, this is fantastic. I don't want to eat anymore. What's happening is that they're literally not eating anymore. It's very, it reminds me so much of what we saw years ago when bariatric surgery was the the thing, right? We're going to solve everything by... And to the point, we're giving it to kids. Exactly what you were talking about earlier. Go ahead. Oh, I'll get there. What you're doing is you're trying to solve a neurometabolic illness that has huge sociocultural influences with weight loss. I have never, ever seen anybody treat an eating disorder through weight loss or starvation, ever. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I've never known that or seen that. In fact, that's the last thing you want to do with someone that has that, those genetics or those neurometabolic underpinnings, because what it does is it just activates the eating disorder. So if anybody has a history of an eating disorder, if anybody has a current eating disorder, I would not recommend that you are on these medications. And dialectically, because I know multiple things are true, of course, people with eating disorders are being prescribed these medications. And I don't judge them. Of course, they, why wouldn't they? That's the influence of diet culture. So people would say to me, when Ozempic was being prescribed, some of my colleagues were upset with me because I would continue to see patients that were taking them. And they'd say, you are not aligned with eating disorder recovery because you are supporting weight loss and that's, you're not an ally. And I I said, I think I would not be an ally if I abandoned people who are are just doing what culture has imposed upon them. These are people that have often been bullied for weight and shape, who feel extremely awful about their bodies. And now there's this panacea, right? I would rather work with them to make sure that they don't get medically unstable. I'd rather work with them to really make sure that they're treating their eating disorder and not just... And that's exactly what happens. I have so many people now who say to me, I I wish I could get off this. This has ruined my life. They're losing their hair. They're medically unstable. And it's just really scary the way that it's just being used. We don't even have research studies to look at the long-term effects of this on people with eating disorders. It's very dangerous. Especially with uh, young people, we don't have uh, research. Like it, it's not just weight loss. It's I, uh, oftentimes with obesity comes di- diabetes, and it is that is the primary treatment for diabetes, or one of the primary treatments. But what, what's your thoughts about with children, and how would you treat somebody? with an eating disorder who's on it, where their appetite is artificially suppressed. That's Again, I, I am cons- so a few things. I think that the way that I've always worked, whether someone has diabetes or epilepsy, there's lots of medical recommendations if somebody has an, a co-occurring physical illness, right? So I, it reminds me of working with a young person with epilepsy and there were very particular 
diet regimes that they needed to follow that were quite restrictive at one point that were actually making the eating disorder worse. And so again, multiple things are true. So how can we eat in a way that that mitigates the epilepsy and does not activate or reinforce the eating disorder? So I tried it like same thing with my clients with diabetes, right? Okay, again, but I'm not a weight loss person. So that's the thing. Like I don't ever, I talk about normalized eating. I talk about movement. I talk about, but I'm not someone that believes that weight loss is going to solve all of the problems. We also know it's very interesting when we we teach a lot about weight science, which is this other piece around. If you look at the data on weight and body weight alone is not as predictive as we hear that it is in terms of medical complications. What is actually more predictive of medical complications is weight discrimination and weight bias. So people are more likely to not seek medical care, to not feel safe with medical care, to not even get the medical care that they need because so many people, physicians, let's say, look at the body weight and they won't even treat the other things. They're so focused on weight when in fact, most people, there's lots of people that live in all kinds of body shapes and sizes that are not unhealthy. So it's the science around body weight as an independent predictor is not as clear and clean as as we're told it is. Yeah. Okay. Are your concerns about bariatric surgery more or less the same as they are about the GLP ones? Or did you I have would say so. Additional? Oh. I would say so. Because one of the things that's very typical about post-bariatric surgery is yes, sure. there is a need to restrict food, right? You just simply well, can't. That, but this body. is it. When you remove or, or tie off parts of the stomach, that person, this is the problem. This is what we all, we see this all the time. We have somebody that goes in for bariatric surgery that has an eating disorder, never been treated. They get bariatric surgery. Now they can't eat or they can and it's, it can be dangerous. And they still have an eating disorder. So we've had people that are still binging and purging post-bariatric surgery, which can be very dangerous because now physiologically your body can't handle that. There's also post-bariatric surgery, things like dumping syndrome and like where people did start to develop really dangerous hypoglycemic episodes. But it, so again, what happens is you're, the person learns to avo- tries to avoid eating at all costs and that the eating disorder just thrives on that. It's very painful and I'm very careful not to blame clients because I think it's so easy for people to go, oh, they shouldn't have had bariatric surgery. You shouldn't be on Ozempic. No, the responsibility to me is squarely on the pharmaceutical companies and the marketers who, to me, are not doing their due diligence. People are trying to survive and people feel really lousy about themselves. So we're on the same page. Yeah. As a segue into our second podcast, which is about food addiction, can we just talk about general addiction now? What happens when you have somebody come in with an eating disorder who has the history of a prior addiction or a concurrent one like cocaine addiction, which restricts appetite? What do you yeah. think is that? And so uh, what, what happens when people get treated for their, their eating disorder? Do they pick up another addiction? So I'll throw that ball at you. I, I think that's an excellent question. It's actually quite common that people that struggle with eating disorders also have substance use difficulties, et cetera. One, you have to assess the situation. Somebody that that has a cocaine addiction, I have to know whether or not they need a much higher level of care in order to manage that. So it's hard to manage that outpatient. So it depends where are they with their substance use? Do they need a period of time where at least we can try to get them off that or reduce that? Because it could be very hard to treat an eating disorder if somebody is has an addiction to heroin or cocaine or something like that. Because again, like you said, the very nature of those drugs is to suppress appetite, uh, rev up <laughs> metabolism. Do you also have somebody that's really psychologically unstable? Like the ballerina whose job career is based on weight. Yeah. It's the influence. And I've seen a number of ballerinas or uh, jockeys who um, are cocaine addicts and they admit they have uh, an eating disorder that develops because of their career. Yeah. So this is then, so again, there's always like, how stable is this person? Is this an outpatient treatment? Is this a day hospital treatment for a period of time? Is this this inpatient. That's always my first, who is sitting across from me? And usually those co-occurring things also come with a trauma history. Not always, but I'm, I want to know the big picture. Is there suicide? Is there self-harm? Is there, what, because they often fall together. So I start, I believe that good treatment stems from a very good conceptualization and one that is a collaborative conceptualization. Other things I guess that I would point out is that I would teach people about how they make sense. So a big part of what I do is the you make sense conversation, right? Which is, of course, you're addicted to cocaine because look at your history, look at your genetics, look at this. Of course, you have an eating disorder because one, two, three, four, five. 
so that the person, it's like the two of us sit in a room putting a puzzle together. Like, when it's, oh, we've got, of course, this is what goes on, right? Of course, you don't want to stop using cocaine because that's how you maintain your ballerina regime. Of course, holy smokes. Then you got to do some commitment work. Like, do we want to change this thing? This is me being very DBT, but you have to, what is the, I call life worth living. What would make it, what would have to happen? What would you want? Is it your goal to be on cocaine in three years and be in the hospital because you also have anorexia? Is that, because if that's your goal, you are killing it. You know what you're doing. I'm very irreverent. On the other hand, nobody says yes. Nobody, people say, I just need to get through this period or if I can just do. And so then we start to construct a treatment plan that addresses why these behaviors not only started, but why they're maintained. Somebody that's got an addiction and also has an eating disorder, I'm already thinking, what is their emotion, capa- emotion reg capacity? Can they, t- we talked about tolerating distress and integrating emotional experiencing. Are they relationally skilled? A lot of them aren't, right? So that they, it's very hard for people to know what they need when they need it. Those sorts of things. Are, these are just some of the things I think about. You do see, as we talked about before, there can be symptom sub- substitution. This is why I like a DBT model when there's co-occurring as opposed to not. A lot of my clients will historically have gone to eating disorder programs who will say, oh, you have an addiction. We can't do that. You're going to have to go take care of the addiction. You know this. Or I vice see that all the time. I right. see that or, all the time. Yeah. Or they'll go to a substance use treatment program and they're stellar at the substance use, but nobody's working on helping them eat and deal with weight issues and body image. And right. And so there's this, they, they float around the system, not really getting what they need. And the, the best way I know how to do that, the, the experience that I've had is that DBT, med DBT particularly, has allowed me to do both of those things simultaneously. Yeah, absolutely. Because I certainly know like any time in my own personal history, if I was taking care of the addiction, then the eating disorder would come up. But if I was in the addiction, the eating disorder was quiet. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.